But it, it was kind of interesting how it fell that way. Because Well, I'm glad everybody else is having a good laugh to kind of lighten things up a little bit this morning. I have a personal understanding of what Zacchaeus' situation is. Uh, we, but we know that, and, and kind of link that off, uh, the story of Zacchaeus in Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10, is, uh, was, took place when Jesus was in Jericho, or, and he, uh, he was thronged, uh, the crown thronged around him. How many, how many of you have been in a throng of people? Probably all of us, right? And we are trying to see this person in the middle who's not basically up on a stage, right? He's just kind of walk, walking along, and everybody's kind of, and I can personally understand this, get looking up to try to see, and you can never get high enough. And why do I make a point out of that? Because Zacchaeus was in that crowd, and he wanted to see Jesus. So let's, before we go off and, and talk about that a little bit, let's look at question number one. What was Zacchaeus' social position? I think it's important for us to understand what his social position was. He was a chief tax collector. Okay, he was a chief tax collector, and I'm sorry. He was rich, okay, as a result of that, right? As a result of him being the chief, chief tax collector, he was rich. And people probably um, associated with him being rich as a result of he got that wealth because he cheated people in their taxes. But what we're going to find out later in this story that he did he actually was an honest man. He did what he was supposed to do, and he came by his status and his position and all the riches that he had in a honest way, and he didn't deserve the, uh, the ridicule and, and being despised by the Jews that maybe a lot of the other tax collectors did. Well, we'll find out a little bit later in the story. He was a person of... Uh, importance and great consideration. And we can get this because if you look at the word uh, that was translated, man, in verse 2, it talks about he was a man indeed, which means he was a person of great importance. He had a lot of a good standing uh, in the area that he was in. He was a Jew. Uh, he was an officer, superior rank in the government. And like we said earlier, he was a chief tax collector. Uh, but it's kind of interesting. I was looking at what the word Zacchaeus means. Did anybody look that up? What the name Zacchaeus means. It's kind of interesting. It means uh, uh, he was um, pure, just, or innocent. Isn't that interesting that his, the name that was given to him was meant those things, but he was in a position of being a tax collector that he was have, had these things brought upon him that people assumed that he was a cheat and he was getting uh, more than the taxes that were due him and due the government by getting, being able to assume his rank. So we, we talked about that he sought to see Jesus, but he couldn't because he was short. And, you know, it's kind of interesting. He, he could have just said, yeah, okay. How many, how many of you have been in a crowd and you really, like we talked about earlier, really trying to see something? And eventually you aren't able to see it, like you see some famous person or something. And you just kind of go, oh, well, it's not in the cards. I'm just going to walk away. I'm just not going to deal with it. It's really, I thought it was important, but it's really not that important. How many of you guys have ever had that happen to you? Have me, obviously. But it, it, that didn't happen to Zacchaeus. He had a great, he had a desire to see Jesus. He went and he made preparations to be able to see him by running ahead and climbed a tree to be able to see him. 
Now let's picture this. Okay? Rich man, great importance, <coughs> climbing up in a tree to go see someone that he wanted to see. What do you think that kind of had to do? He really had to want to see him, didn't he? So, because someone of his stature in the community or in the government, that wouldn't be something that they would normally do, would it? I mean, normally it would be, he would be given that, right? But he had to make the effort to go see Jesus. So he made preparations to go do that. And when Jesus came to him, came by and saw him, he told him to make haste and come down. So it's kind of interesting. What do you think, why do you think Jesus, just as a, a, story, a part of the story, why do you think Jesus picked Zacchaeus? Why do you think he, he made the effort to pick him? Yeah, Larry? Well, it might have been because of his, uh, that he was an honest man. Okay. But did, would that have been, yes? Okay. Like he changed. Okay. You so know what I'm saying? Yep. I, I, I kinda I was going back and forth on that. Yeah, Ronnie. must be reading my notes because that's where I, exactly where I was going to go next. Yes, Jeremiah? Verse 10, the parallel to what he did. Um, Jesus is seeking to save the lost and all these people are lost. But uh, he's only going to find those who are seeking him. And that's, that's the point. And John 2, early in his ministry, um, says that he didn't commit himself to some um, because they didn't commit themselves to him. He knew their heart. follow up with both those comments, he, um, he knew Zacchaeus' heart. He, just like Jesus picked people out, he knew their hearts, right? He knew that as a result of the action possibly, that his desire to see Jesus, and also because Jesus was able to know the heart of a person and was able to understand what, they, what their soul needed and what they needed, he picked Zacchaeus and it's also interesting that see, we talked earlier that Zacchaeus was a man of great importance, right? So it's kind of in interesting that he was of great importance. Jesus basically invited himself into this person's home. And he was willing to go ahead and honor that, right? Because of his desire to see Jesus and to understand what was going on. What was the reaction? Did what, in question number three, what was the act, action or reaction did the multitude have to Jesus eating with Zacchaeus? What was the multitude's reaction? Right, there was a lot of examples of that, right? Yeah. Of, 
of them doing that. Okay? They didn't think it was becoming for a teacher, a prophet, and a messiah to do this. Plus, what? They hated publicans, right? The Jews hated, hated publicans or tax collectors. So then what happened was when Zacchaeus went, or Jesus went to Zacchaeus' house, he stood and began to make confession that, and he wanted to justify Jesus and to show that he was worthy of the honor that Jesus did, but he also denied being an extortioner or unjust and declared what he did. He was willing, and what indicates Zacchaeus was willing to repent? He was willing to make things right. Yes? Are you saying that he did these things after he talked to Jesus? Or this is the thing he did to get him back in his regular way of doing it? I, I want to hear what everybody else has to say about that, because I was kind of sorting through that. Yeah, Kyle? Well, he said, if, I think it's if he did this, he res right. would restore. Right. Right. Yeah, Jeremiah? Uh, I mean, it's possible, too, that going back to chapter 3, what John was preaching and some of the tax collectors asked was what we do to repent. And he told them, so it's possible that that's where a change that was made that occurred. But even if that's not the case and this is something he's presently doing, the idea that if I have taken anything from anyone, I restore full soul. Ron, do you still have something? Well, I'm pretty much sure my okay. The, the, the comment, I, I restore, suggests to me that he has done this. Okay. Not that I will do it, or I have to. He, you know, if I have, I've done it. So that suggests to me that he, and, and I, I like, I hadn't thought about what Jeremiah said, but I, that he may have, he may have already heard these. Or he might have been a good businessman, but yeah, he may have, right? Okay, we yes, don't we don't know the story. Yep, we are. Yep, go ahead, James, and then. Well, I, just the chapter before, he talked about the uh, parable of the tax collector, you know, the, uh, the Pharisee yeah. and the tax collector. Right. He, he gave that comparison right there, and now we have a tax collector. Mm -hmm. So it, it's continuing on with some of the same teachings he had. Pharisees and Jews were judging people. They were not looking at them in the right light, you know, as far as, you know, you're just as bad as everybody else. They were lumping them all together, right? Okay. Uh, yeah, Steve, Steve, do you have something?
Right. Okay. I think the important thing is here that, yes, you have a comment. Go ahead. I feel like um, Judge Harris, you must have heard teaching of Jesus. He, he obviously had not met him before because, you know, he was trying to work from his power. But he desired so much to know more about the teacher that he climbed up into a tree. I mean, yeah, I feel like he was probably this unrighteous man, tax collector, thinking more than he should have, false accusations of the church of Christ. But he didn't want to be with him anymore. And Jesus was the answer. And so he goes and he meets with him. When Jesus says, come down, I'm coming to your house, he didn't think, okay, let's go. He joyfully received him. Mm -hmm. And so he really wanted to know. And the next thing he does is say, Lord, I've got to repent. I've got to confess. And this is what my sin has done. Jesus says, this day of salvation has come to this house. Okay, one more comment, Larry, and then i got to move on to the next There's a couple of ways he, he could milk the system. He could take more than he should have. He could also understate the income and pocket as much as possible. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's ways that uh, people are handling money. They can, they can uh, milk the system. But uh, apparently this was a guy that was had a square deal. And uh, he was uh, not only that, but he lived a second mile, you know, giving people back more right. than he accidentally took too much. He just foretold it back to him. So he didn't have to do that. Okay. Go ahead. And I think that's, that's probably, to me, that's one of the most important parts of this is that if he has done it, his heart was right. Jesus knew that his heart was right because that's why he picked him, right? That he was going to restore this lost person, the lost sheep of Israel, and he was going to restore him. Okay, let's go ahead and move on. I'm not going to get through 10% of my material, but that's okay. Uh, so the next story we want to look at is the parable of the pounds or the manas or whatever translation you have. Uh, there is so much material in here, I'm probably just going to skim over this because there's way a lot of material in this. One thing I noticed was when I was doing this study was there are actually two different parables that deal with this. There's this one here, the parable of the pounds, but also the parable of the talents. And they're two separate parables. One parable was spoken, uh, the pounds was in Jericho on the way from Jericho to Jerusalem. The parable of the talents was actually on the Mount of Olives near Jerusalem. So I, I always looked at this before I studied this and it's like, okay, are these the same or not? Well, they're obviously not the same. And, and they really probably have different meanings. Uh, the, the parable of the pounds was spoken to the multitudes, and the parable of the talents was spoken to the innermost circle of Jesus, his trusted followers. So, interesting, what, in question number seven, uh, what prompted Jesus to give this parable? Why did, why did he do this? Right, and that kind of that leads into the next account that we're going to look at, hopefully, is the entry of Jesus into Jerusalem 
And that whole pomp and that whole thing of him entering into Jerusalem was what? Because they thought that the kingdom was going to be restored, right? It would be an earthly kingdom. And that's what precipitated that also. So they, this parable that Jesus told, he realized he was getting near there, and they expected this. And then Jesus told this parable in an attempt to do what? To calm, tone it down, the anticipation, and explain to them what he was really all about. Uh, and to offset the anticipation that they had. It's kind of interesting, real quick, uh, this parable actually draws, it was in the book, draws from an actual, actual historical circumstance uh, that had happened earlier when uh, Herod's son went to Rome to request to be made, the, to, uh, made king, and the Jewish ambassadors, they, yeah, they went to Rome and they asked him to not be. You know, it's kind of interesting. If you look at that, there's really a lot of parallels there to that account that, that happened, a real account that happened and this parable. And I think maybe Jesus was, was using this parable to associate back to something that these people were familiar with back then, that this account, this actually happened. And it was something they could uh, personally understand. Uh, I'm not going to rent. I had to go through the parables. I'm not going to do that. Uh, so the important thing is the noble handed out some money, right, to, to ten different people. And the thing is, he returned and calls his servants to give an account, right? How many of you guys have had that happen? Somebody gives and trusts something to you, and then they come back and they say, "Okay, it's time to give an account." Tell me what you did. Am I going to be happy with it? And what's the normal feeling of that? I hope I did. Right? I hope I did the right thing. Well, what we find out here is two of them were right, one was wrong. So the first reported he had used his pounds to earn 10 pounds, and he was pleased. The second, the same, he gained five pounds, and he was pleased. But it's interesting what, in question number nine, uh, what uh, concept did the servants who hid the money have of the master, and was it accurate? It was accurate. It's that he was a you know a pure man. That you know why you know do you didn't you don't you don't reap what you sow. You work you don't reap what you sow. You reap what we sow. And the, he said, yeah, absolutely. That's my job. I'm, I'm the head guy. You know, I don't have to do the work. I manage the work. Uh, and the result of that fear, right, caused him to not do anything, which was probably the worst thing he could have done, right? Yeah. It might have been an improper estimation of him, so maybe an uh, improper uh, interpretation of his position, because he's obviously a gracious master uh, who would then turn into a gracious king. And I think when he says, And we know that, and another reason why we know that is because when all this had, had transpired, right, and it was time, and this, this one that um, didn't do what he was supposed to, he gave whatever that one thing was. He could have just kept it, right, but he gave it to the one that had ten, right? And there's a lot of, that we can gain out of that. I probably don't have time to get through all that. Uh, but... It's it, in question number 10, what does out of thine own mouth I will judge you mean? I'm sorry. Exactly. He was judged by his words, right? 
Okay. He didn't know, but he didn't obey the master because he was afraid of what the master might do to him, right? Well, the master ended up doing what the man thought he was going to do, right? So, yeah, it's a it's it's a very interesting story, and I could get into the meaning of these two, but that would get way too much in the weeds for what I have time. Uh, but I think the the first one of the first things, one of the things we could get out of this, and there's I, actually I had two meanings for it. Uh, the one who neglects the trust given to him shall lose it. And the one who diligently uses that which is entrusted to him increases it, more will be given. If we, if we are trusted with things and we don't do what we're supposed to do with it, then we're going to lose it. And if we do what we're supposed to do with things, like the gospel and spread the gospel to others, then... More will be added. We'll have more opportunities, I think, is, is what that's getting at. And I think in Luke chapter 8, verses 18, it also talks about that. Uh, that it talks, therefore, take heed how you hear, for whoever has, to him more will be given. And to whoever does not have, even what he seems to have will be taken away from him. So that's another reference uh, for that. Okay. Um, just one last thing on this. Question number 11. What happened to each one of the servants? Let's go through that in question 11. Servants who used the pound faithfully, what happened to them? They were rewarded, right? Okay. And the servant, uh, says servants, they're just the, so both of them, Right. What happened to the servant who hid the pound? Everything was taken away from him. Okay. And he, he was rejected, and it was given to another. And the citizens who refused to accept the king, kind of a little side story here, what happened to them? Okay. They were taken out and slain, right? Okay. And there's a lot of things that we could read into this as far as Jesus and, you know, that the citizens who refused to accept the king, who would that be in this account? Pharisees. The Pharisees, the people, right? And they, what, what would happen to them? They would be taken away, right? And they would suffer the punishment as a result. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on to the triumphant entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, uh, and there's a lot. Of, there's a couple of prophecies that deal with this. Probably more that I didn't find, but there's one it talks about in uh, Zechariah chapter nine, verse nine, where it talks about. Uh, and I think as a result of that prophecy, Jesus probably knew what was going to happen. He probably knew what was going to happen anyhow. But the prophecy said that um, it said greatly rejoice in Zechariah 9.9 9, great rejoice O daughter of Zion shout O daughter of Jerusalem behold your king is coming to you he is just and having salvation and here's the important part lowly and riding on a donkey a colt a fold of a donkey so here that prophecy proclaims what's going to happen here on when Jesus comes to uh, the, in his life so he was on the way to Jerusalem, and we're not going to go through the, I think you guys know the story, uh, or the account here of the triumphal entry, so I'm not going to go through that. I'm going to assume everybody's prepared and read all that. Uh, so he told them where the cult would be, and, he, and he, when they went and found it, told the owner everything was good. So it's interesting that when they came back and put their garments on the cult, and they sent, set Jesus on the colt. You know, it was kind of interesting. I don't remember if it was in the book or some other material I looked at, but this is the only account of Jesus riding on an animal in the New Testament. I think I was in, I thought that was interesting. That 
but all the, the journeys and all the places he went, he walked everywhere, right? This was the only account of that. And it, it's referenced, this account that happened here is, just out of a reference, is back in those days, ancients were accustomed to having put clothes and flowers and other adornments along the way before the kings and their triumphal marches. So this was not something new. This is they they associated, like Foster said earlier, Jesus as becoming king, an earthly king, and this and it would happen in Jerusalem, and they were providing the the means to be for this to be able to happen, right? So it's kind of interesting, but it really isn't. This isn't new. This is things that happened back there in those times, all the time when a, a king came and. This was a way of them proclaiming him and, and all the things that he did. So, uh, so what attitude, and this is the one that I want, want to try to concentrate on, what attitude toward Jesus did the multitude display? Would you have that? Question number uh, 14. They were ready to make a king. Okay, they were ready to make a king, okay. Uh, they began to rejoice, pray God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had been seeing. So they knew, they were aware of Jesus, right? And they knew all the things that he'd done and that he was a person, or a, the, the promised person, right? So they knew that. And they uh, began, they rejoiced and praised God. Okay, and then they said, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. So it's kind of interesting how this started. Uh, the chorus of praise, and one, one art, something I read said, the chorus of praise by procession that accompanied Jesus, so it started there, and it swelled by the multitude coming out of the city. So it wasn't just the people that were following him. They, this happened, and then the people came out also. In, in, uh, in one of the verses, it talks about how they came out of the city and they did this also. Uh, so the uh, so what did this do? This served to bring uh, his claim prominently before the people of Jerusalem. You know, maybe there was someone in Jerusalem that didn't understand Jesus' claim. But to me, the Pharisees and all the leaders and all the Jewish leaders, right, saw this. What do you think they thought about this? They hated Jesus, right? They, des they despised him. So what do you think this did to them? What do you think there was the, re the reaction of the Jewish leaders at this point? Okay. They were... We're going to get to that in a minute, yeah. oh, but that's that's true. Yeah, Jason. Later on, it's, it talks about uh, Pilate knowing that they delivered Jesus over because of jealousy. It wasn't a, a doubt that he was healing or doing any of those things. It was that fact that they didn't want to give up their their places of importance in that culture, and they would rather kill someone who was performing miracles than just give up. Okay, and, and if, go, if we go on and look at uh, question number 16, why did, they, why did the Pharisees try to stop this? Because they told Jesus to stop this, right? Why, why did they try to stop it? It was seen as a rebellion in the Roman, Roman government's eyes. Okay, it was big. Okay, that was one thing. And they took offense to it. And to add on to, to another part of that was they took offense at the application to Jesus of the prophetic words which could be used in reference to the Messiah. The things they were talking about actually is blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory to the highest. What was that in reference to? The Messiah, right? So they were, they took offense to that. Yes,
Right. And this triumph and entry is the final <coughs> clause that just kind of hammers home their hatred for this person that's winning the crowd and taking their glory away. So everything we're going to study from this point on is very, very important because if you think about it, you've got a week to live, you're going to concentrate on those most important things that you've got left. kind of put it in to add, to add to that. Jesus is really going to hammer this home, right, with the things that, that he's going to talk about. Okay. Uh, Jeremiah, do you have something? Well, just in John's record, remember, he had just raised Lazarus from the dead, and they had already decided to be guys that really mm-hmm. got to kill him and Lazarus. And then it says that you know, the world's going after him, nothing's working. And so they're growing restless and worried and jealous and angry and all of it. And, and the possible <coughs> It's just getting worse, right? They're getting more and more and more. Just it's building, right? And it's going to build even more, like Ronnie said during this week, of all the things that, that he's, is going to happen to him. You know, it's kind of interesting. If you look at, let's go ahead and look at the next section, weeping over Jerusalem. Uh, why did Jesus weep over Jerusalem? Why was he weeping about Jerusalem? You know, the city of Jerusalem, it's, it's kind of interesting. If you look at the geography here in this situation, Jesus is coming into Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, that area, and he's going to descend down into a valley, and he's going to come back up into the city of Jerusalem. So I think it's really interesting if you look at the geography of this, that Jesus is coming over, and what's in front of him? It's the city of Jerusalem. It's right there for him to see. So what would, if if you knew what was going to happen, and Jesus knew what was going to happen, what would be your reaction? You'd be weeping, right? You'd be be concerned. You would be feeling bad about what was going to happen to them, and that's the view you're going to have, is you're coming over and you're looking at this city in front of you. So I thought that was interesting to to, to kind of point out that he's a, a, a... this visual reference. But what, uh, why, why did they do this? They, uh, <coughs> when Jesus talked about it in, uh, also in verse 42, Jesus seemed to mean that if Jerusalem and the multitude <coughs> knew who he really was and that he was the Christ and not what they were looking forward to, an earthly king, they could have saved the city. They still could have done it. But like we said earlier, the Jewish leaders and all the, all, all the, the people that were in, in prominence weren't going to let that happen. But that the, Jesus knew what was coming. And one thing I was had was why was Jews, Jerusalem destroyed? <clears throat> one thing I had was, and, and just to underline, I know it's because of their disbelief, but also... Uh, their prejudice, ignorance, and their unbelief have blinded their eyes, and as a result, they rejected Jesus as the Messiah. It was their, their uh, these underlying things. When was Jesus? When was Jerusalem destroyed? Okay, eighty seventy. Okay, and it's kind of interesting that uh, Jesus predicted that the city will be leveled to the ground. Not going to be anything left of it. And I read something, I think maybe it was in the book. It says that Josephus provides a description of the city siege and how effective it was. And he basically described what was it. It was leveled to the ground. Total desolation is a result of what they did. Okay. Didn't get to my last section. I was close. Thank you very much for all the comments and, and all the help going through the class.